Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let me um, open this uh, second session uh, of our conference on uh, the um, institutional quality and sustainable economic convergence um, in uh, Central Eastern and Southeastern uh, European countries. And the session is on challenges and policies to attain sustainable convergence. So that will be very much uh, building on the insights uh, we got in the first session, and uh, it will be very much informed by the first session, actually. A lot of issues uh, came in the discussion already. So we're here to uh, take it further, uh, to uh, discuss the policy consequences of uh, the, uh, the lessons learned from the, uh, the, uh, the past years of convergence, which were discussed this morning. So what are the policy steps to be taken to, uh, to improve, to change, to, uh, to overcome uh, convergence fatigue, as it may be called, which was discussed this morning, uh, to, uh, to step up uh, TFP growth, uh, to, uh, to achieve sustainable convergence uh, towards uh, the, uh, the EU. Um, and we may, by the way, discuss, and that was already a little bit this morning, but we, we can come back to the discussion on what really what's really the meaning of convergence, towards, with, towards what do we want to converge, given that the EU itself and the Eurozone itself uh, hasn't shown uh, a great performance in terms of convergence. So uh, it would be interesting to, to discuss also um, where, where you want to converge uh, here. Uh, and it's also an opportunity to, uh, to take further the discussion on some of the key um, um, drivers of convergence, in particular uh, the uh, institutional issues which were addressed this morning, uh, but with a more forward-looking uh, view. So um, we have uh, six excellent speakers. Um, I'm not doing much of an introduction because they are very well known, but just to list them, we'll have uh, two uh, keynote introductions by uh, Jörg de Cressin, who's Deputy Director uh, at the European Department uh, at the IMF. Uh, and by uh, Isfan Jekeli, who's uh, director at the uh, European Commission, um, ECFIN. Uh, and then uh, the um, presentations will be discussed by uh, Kalin Christoph, who's a deputy governor at the uh, Bulgarian National Bank, by Deborah Revoltella, who's director of the economics department at the EIB, um, by Gent uh, Seiko, who's the governor uh, of Albania, and by uh, Boris Vucic, uh, who's the governor. Uh, in uh, Croatia. So that's really a uh, very uh, well diversified and, uh, and, 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 uh, and very, very competent panel. Uh, so without due delay, uh, I give the floor to, uh, to Jörg for the first presentation. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. So the title of my presentation is Convergence and Institutions. I will go very quickly over convergence and spend more time on institutions because we established already many uh, findings this morning. So this chart just simply shows you in a red line the path of per capita GDP in Korea in percent of US per capita GDP and along it we have plotted for the years 2000-2008 the convergence path of uh, many Central, Eastern and Southeastern European economies. What you can see is basically what we said before, the pace of convergence has in many countries been quite fast, comparable to uh, that ex enjoyed by Korea. You can put the exact same chart now, uh, but starting in 2009, and we have the slowdown in convergence that has happened. We have established this also this morning. And you can then ask yourself the question, well, what's driven the slowdown? We have done this also this morning. Uh, was it labor, capital, or TFP? And when you break it down, the change is really driven by much uh, slower TFP growth or even negative TFP growth. Um, we have tried to throw a battery of explanatory variables at this and haven't found much that sticks, except that uh, the variable TFP growth slowed elsewhere was the best explanatory factor for TFP <laughs> growth slowing in Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe. In other words, there is not that much that we know. We have some hypotheses that the literature is pursuing, but not altogether a convincing explanation. Now let's look ahead a little bit, um, and let's start with the various inputs. Uh, let's worry first about uh, labor. Here what I'm showing you is uh, an index for the working age population, and what you can see is that in Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe, outside Turkey, the working age population is projected to fall 
quite appreciably. So this will make for a significant headwind to growth prospects over the medium term. Um, part of this will likely be uh, appreciable emigration from the region. This chart here gives you a little bit of perspective on history. On the left, you can see the cumulative outflow of people from uh, <coughs> Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe. And since 1990, it's more than 20 million people, so somewhere between 20 and 24 million people. We have uh, in a staff discussion note on the impact of immigration on growth uh, calculated uh, the losses for real GDP. They are plotted on the right-hand side. They have been very large, particularly large for smaller countries like Albania that have lost a large share of people, but also large elsewhere. It is likely that going forward, many, but not all of these countries, but many will continue to experience outflows. Some may even experience inflows, but most of them are likely to experience uh, further outflows of people. And so immigration will also weigh uh, on growth going forwards. Let's then uh, talk a little bit about prospects for more capital intensive growth. Um, we've already established this morning that uh, the catch-up process in Central East and Southeastern Europe was largely driven by TFP um, and that capital played, for example, a smaller role than it did in, uh, in Korea. Uh, can this change? Well, here on the left-hand side you see gross investment in 2016 and on the right-hand side gross uh, domestic savings expressed in percent of GDP. And what you see is that, let's start with saving, that it is uh, um, relatively low compared to the EU15 average and certainly a very different picture than the one that you would have if you were to put Korea down there. So there are constraints in terms of how much um, uh, investment you can generate without running, again, large uh, external uh, imbalances. And in this regard, unlike before the crisis, uh, the financial conditions have uh, become tighter on this front. Um, and so prospects for uh, capital-intensive uh, catch-up are also not particularly good unless uh, one changes something about uh, domestic savings. So this leads me uh, to uh, the part on institutions. Um, we've, we and us have uh, had many experiences in these, in these uh, countries, and uh, you've already heard many people this morning uh, concluding that better institutions will be key uh, for uh, restarting the convergence process after uh, this uh, crisis. It'll be key to improve prospects for attracting foreign investment, but also key to uh, transform these economies to innovation-based economies that, uh, again, experience a different type than of TFP growth. Um, our sense is, therefore, improving uh, institutions is very important and that there is uh, much that can be done. This chart here expresses what can be done. It's a different version of some charts you've seen this morning, there's on the left-hand side a rule of law indicator from uh, the World Bank uh, Governance Indicators database, and on the right-hand side, an indicator of protection of property rights, which comes from the World Economic Forum. Um, obviously, these uh, data are all to be uh, taken with a grain of salt, as many other data. Um, but the general picture that emerges is that um, uh, in Northwestern Europe, you have countries that are among those that are considered to be the strongest with respect to the rule of law and protection of properties rights. While in southern and in southeastern Europe, the picture is much more mixed. There is room for improving um, institutions, uh, notably the economic aspects of the rule of law and the judiciary. This uh, chart shows you uh, the same, but for judicial independence, impartiality of courts, uh, these are perception-based in indicators drawn from World Economic Forum. Again, there is uh, room for improvement uh, in South e Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe, but also elsewhere in Southern Europe, you know, in terms of uh, these institutions. Um, here we have yet another set of indicators on the left-hand side. It's this time a quantitative indicator on case resolution rates uh, that's been uh, put together by the European Commission of Justice project, uh, what you can see there, which is supposed to capture a little bit the efficiency of the judiciary, you can see that the Central, Eastern, and Southeastern European economies are not comparing badly to the EU15, but there is much more variation. Um, and uh, in general, those that are outside the EU are not uh, doing as well as those inside the EU. Now, if, remember, this is efficiency, uh, one indicator of efficiency, and that is, of course, not all the justice system is about. There is much more to it. On the right-hand side from Eurobarometer, a, perceived, a perception index on independence of courts. Again, there, there you see now a significant gap uh, in Central, Eastern, Southeastern Europe. 
relative to the rest. So we wanted to basically uh, step away from these data and rather uh, survey uh, the history of a number of these countries to learn, um, to learn how they have changed uh, their institutions and specifically how they have changed the economic aspects of the rule of law and the judiciary uh, since the transformation process started and why there have been different outcomes across different countries uh, and what one can learn from these. Um, so the six countries that we are working on now are listed over there, um, but uh, what I will do here is just focus on two to try and explain to you a little bit um, uh, wh what we've been finding. And the two are Estonia and Romania. So, and what I will say, it's important that you bear in mind that uh, institutions are often seen as the outcomes of struggles for political and economic power in societies. Um, the basic idea is that in societies where um, there are no dominant players, so where uh, both economic and political power is fairly evenly distributed, uh, the, the institutions that uh, emerge are better and more efficient institutions. So bear this in mind as I'm telling you this, uh, the findings of uh, our, um, of our uh, ongoing research. So here you see indicators again of rule of law, judicial independence and, and protection of property rights, the economic aspects of it for these two countries. And you can see that Estonia is in a different place than Romania. Estonia actually compares favorably with a number of uh, Western European economies. Uh, Romania uh, is not at that level, but has also improved a lot over time. So there's been a lot of improvement in both, but to different, to different degrees. And the question is, of course, what can we learn from this? And so I'll spend some time on this chart here. Um, what can we learn from this? Five points. Initial conditions matter, distribution of resources matter, transparency matters, state capacity, and the role of the EU. And I'll tell you uh, about each of them in some detail. So, Starting with initial conditions, in Estonia, uh, right at the beginning of the transition, there was a very clear break with Soviet communism, which was seen basically as an occupying force. Uh, Estonia was occupied, um, was, was part of the Soviet Union. It wasn't part before uh, the Second World War. It was seen as an occupying force to be rejected. It developed a fairly strong civil society in the 1980s, which uh, in uh, uh, 1989, led to a singing revolution where a large chain of people was formed across the Baltics uh, agitating for democracy. And in 1991, it declared formal independence during the Soviet coup in Moscow. The history of, of Romania in that regard, and I'm simplifying, I realize, it was different. Uh, I mean, Romania, the country struggled with the economy during the 1980s. There was dissatisfaction. And in the end, uh, when Ceausescu was overthrown, a so-called National Salvation Front took over. This National Salvation Front comprised many people. Members uh, were intellectuals, students, army officers. However, the leadership of this National Salvation Front was also largely composed of former communist officials. So there was not that clear break with the past in uh, Romania. Um, distribution of resources. Um, the policies that were pursued in uh, Estonia and Romania with respect to transformation uh, differed. Um, in Estonia, for example, um, privatization actively sought a broad ownership uh, and equal access for domestic and foreign players to entities that were supposed to be privatized. Domestic entities that were more than one third state owned couldn't even participate in bidding for uh, privatization. And uh, the economy was generally very quickly opened up to foreign trade and investment. The result was a fairly, uh, within the realm of Central, Eastern, and Southeastern economies, a fairly broad, dispersed ownership with dispersed, fairly dispersed uh, centers with a large number of smaller centers of power, including uh, foreigners that were brought in. In Romania, it proved much harder. The previous uh, elites were part of the new government because uh, many communist member states. Privatization was contentious, and to the extent it happened, there was also a good deal of asset stripping and sale at fire prices. Uh, moreover, nationalist forces opposed the participation of foreigners. What resulted was a dispersion of ownership that was much less broad than in, uh, in Estonia, which then had consequences for uh, the institutions that shaped up later. 
Transparency helped. Uh, in Estonia, there was media freedom very early on and an active civil society. In Romania, the, uh, it happened in the course of EU accession when freedom of uh, information legislation was adopted. Uh, a civil society began to form and that civil society then took advantage of this information to expose corrupt behavior by politicians and to launch anti-corruption campaigns. So transparency has been very important. State capacity has been key too. Uh, in Estonia, after a new constitution was adopted in 92, there was a very broad and comprehensive reform of the civil service. Many people were made to leave and the new ones that were recruited were recruited on the basis of merit. It was one of the most comprehensive administrative reforms in the region. In uh, Romania, administrative reform was stop and go, partly because uh, all political uh, elites stayed in the new government. Lastly, the role of the EU. The role of the EU, um, what we conclude is the EU can act as a catalyst, but it cannot be a substitute for a domestic reform movement. In Estonia, one, could, one can say that the acquis communautaire mainly provided benchmarks that uh, society independently wanted to meet. In Romania, um, it was a more complex interactive process. I gave you one example how EU accession led to freedom of the adoption of freedom of, le uh, of information legislation, which then prompted an active civil society to agitate for, for reform, right? So the EU there has played a role, but there has been uh, back and forth in terms of the, pro of the progress, and ultimately what's driving reform in Romania is uh, the, domestic, uh, the domestic forces uh, and, and civil society. So with all of this, you may wonder, um, where does this leave us? What are the conclusions we draw from this and uh, other, the other country cases uh, and, and also some general reading of the literature? So we all agree that strengthening institutions is a priority uh, for uh, the next generation of reforms. Um, we see the formation of economic institutions uh, as a political economy process. Uh, institutions have consequences for the distribution of economic resources and the economic resources in turn have consequences for the institutions. So there are these feedback loops, right? Um, external policy interventions by the, by the Commission or us or the ECB, other multilateral institutions uh, can help but they cannot replace a domestic reform drive. But both uh, <coughs> external and domestic policy makers and here's the way I would put it, can nudge the process in the right direction. And the question is, what measures can we take to nudge the process forward? First, um, strengthening transparency and accountability. Uh, I've mentioned the example of freedom of information legislation adopted in the context of EU accession. We at the IMF are dealing with standard and codes. Uh, the ECB is dealing with respect to uh, the laws and uh, accountability of the national central banks. So we are all in various way, in, uh, ways involved in this business. So strengthening transparency and accountability, number one. Number two, investing in state capacity. Uh, what often happens and has happened in these countries is there was a large systemic change. New rules, new laws were adopted. Lawsuits flooded the courts. Um, the the, the um, the civil service, the lawyers themselves, the, the, the judges were overworked. At the same time, you've had um, massively new opportunities uh, in the private sector, to which then uh, some of the uh, judges and lawyers were drawn. Um, you had long wait times, and all of this made, uh, provided fertile ground for corruption to emerge as far as the implementation of the laws was concerned. So it's important to invest in state capacity. We do this in various ways with our technical assistance, um, especially with our technical assistance, but also uh, it's an issue for, for budget policies and, and payments of civil servants and so forth. So number two was investing to state capacity. And now the last conclusion, which is we need to consider very, very carefully the distributional fallout of the economic policies that we recommend, right? And these economic policies concern notably privatization, competition policy, but also especially fiscal policy. We may have uh, some good objectives in mind, uh, but then when these objectives are realized and come with a skewed distribution in resources and political power over time, uh, they can lead to the undoing of the very reforms that we have implemented. So emphasizing the distribution of fallout of uh, our policies this is the third um, item to which we would draw your attention. And with this, um, I thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Jörg. So the, uh, I mean, that slide provides for a uh, 
I think, a very nice transition uh, to Isvan, since it ends with the role of the EU. So now, Isvan, the floor is yours. Um, I would like to start with thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here, also because I'm actually originally from the region and uh, part of my family is still living in the region. Um, I was a little bit afraid of talking after so many bright people and uh, was wondering what I could add to all this, but then now I realize that I can stand on their shoulders and um, reach higher. Um, let me start with the theoretical framework for convergence. And I think we practically all share this, and this is basically the Atsamoglu Agion Zilabotti framework, where the distance from the frontier has enormous implication on you know, uh, what is happening in this economy. Consequently, what sort of reforms are critical for the country to further progress and reach uh, towards the, or move towards the, 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 the frontier. This also means that over time, and depending on the success of the economy, this will continuously change. And this, you know, managing is this change is a critical uh, a, a part of the process. I will argue in my uh, presentation throughout that countries in the region, many of them, reached close enough to the frontier where a new regime has to kick in, and we already talked about this, which is basically moving from imitation to innovation, to have an innovation-based system where the accumulation of appropriate human capital to support this innovation becomes critical. Firm creation and their internal workings also become critical, since innovation that boosts growth actually takes place inside the firm. And given the nature of innovation and the rapid structural change, dealing with enterprise failure or financing risky projects and taking the consequences of failure becomes absolutely essential. So a quick look at the chart where what we do in, what I do in all my charts is that since we are talking about uh, this framework, everything is measured against the frontier, where the frontier is defined as basically the average of Sweden, Denmark, Netherlands, and Austria. And the beauty of this is that it's a European frontier, but at the same time, it's actually a global frontier as well, because these countries are also at the global frontier on, on many, many aspects, and including actually in the first place income. And what we do, we'll do in this, uh, many of the other charts is to show everything, some of the fundamentals, again, relative to the frontier and compare it to the income level. The important thing about this chart is two very important observations. One is that countries moved up, you know, the whole kind of range moved up. The range did not get much smaller, so the, the, the differences across countries did not diminish much, but the upper part became much more populated. So we used to have only two countries that were relatively close to the frontier. Now we have actually uh, five of them, and some others are also coming up, and most importantly, Poland, which is you know, an important case, and I feel I refer to this uh, several times. Now, if you look into these countries in terms of where are they with, in terms of innovation, then not surprisingly, we see um, Central and Eastern Europe being from moderate to, to modest innovators. Modest is the lowest, moderate is a, a one uh, a, a notch up. And not surprisingly, the frontier that we, we chose are actually the innovation leaders. Uh, a, a, perhaps Austria is a little bit of a, a borderline case there when it comes to innovation as measured in this uh, 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 scoreboard. Now, while properly selected and designed reforms are essential to maintain fast and sustainable convergence, regretfully, not all countries are implementing such reforms. In some countries, reforms are neglected to such an extent that these countries continuously and significantly diverge from the frontier. Worse still, now we see countries in the region that reverse reforms, sometimes fundamental reforms. Uh, unless they reverse the reversal, 
these countries too will at some point start losing their uh, relative income position. Now, political economy, and this is where I can you know, stand on the shoulders of uh, Jörg, he said it's a political economy process, I cannot agree more. Political economy has made important contributions on how to deal with time inconsistency, how to achieve reforms in democratic societies with uninformed voters or non-credible and myopic governments. But we have no models that can explain the kind of reversals that we observe in the region or actually beyond the region as well. Moreover, aggreg the aggregation problem has become bigger, so distributional impacts are important, as was pointed out uh, also by Jörg before. In my view, however, there is more to this matter than just this. Uh, Professor Oman argued recently in Lindau at the uh, meeting of the uh, Nobel Prize winners with young researchers that people need to want things. Without want, incentives will just not work, and thus there is not much scope for economic policy and reforms. Sometimes people don't want things that would be good for them, like a healthy diet, and I'm falling in this category for sure, and typically they want things for reasons other than what they actually need those things for. That is, as Professor Roman put it, there's a need for design for mechanism design. There should be a broad motivating, uh, there should be broad motivating goals that people want for whatever reason, rendering them willing to support reforms that are perceived as useful or necessary to achieve these goals. This would in turn create an environment where politicians want to embark on those reforms and that public sentiment works in favor of reforms and convergence and not against it. If you look back into uh, the recent history of uh, the, the region, we can trace these themes. With the collapse of the old political system and newly acquired uh, national sovereignty, it became possible to unwind the centrally planned economic system and create a market economy. People wanted this because they wanted the, the life they perceived people in the West had. Very soon, they realized that the process of transition was much more complex and would impose on them often very negative short-term costs. Hence came the disillusionment and the subsequent swinging back of the political pendulum. EU membership was the next big motivating goal. It had the promise of joining the West in an institutional form. People wanted it because they wanted to live in a Western country. So the design for mechanism design was there and made use of the incentives. Populists actually worked towards supporting reforms and joining the EU. Reform design, however, was not always careful enough. Some countries entered uh, the EU, but particularly when the crisis hit the regions, reforms started to be reversed in many places and areas. In some cases, populism works against reform and convergence and also against uh, integration. European adoption, uh, sorry, Euro adoption could be the next uh, uh, large motivating goal as it was for some following EU accession, but people will need to want it. EU and EU area membership has in many cases promoted fast and sustainable convergence. However, the experiences of some of the not sufficiently reforming old member states, and this is the chart that it shows, uh, demonstrate that this is not a guarantee. Here we see that divergence from the frontier can occur, but also that they are dominantly driven by lack of reforms efforts at the national level. I will return to this point later. Thus, the Euro area membership offers high rewards to reforming countries, but it may also deliver stronger punishments for countries that have not done their uh, reform homework. Reform reversals and major economic crises are forms of relatively rare, disruptive or even tail events. The impact on convergence in both directions may, however, be more important than we presently perceive. Poland's outstanding performance during the recent crisis is a positive case in point for the region. We need to understand better how reform reversals and their negative impact on convergence can be minimized, how performance during crisis periods can be improved by better reforms and institutional design, or broadly speaking, how resilience can be improved, and actually there was a discussion of the Eurogroup on this uh, uh, recently. There is a growing awareness of the possible impacts of globalization and integration on income distribution, per perception of fairness, and on uncertainty surrounding individual situations. 
Let me suggest that distributional issues in a broader sense are also central to making convergence fast and sustainable. If human capital, particularly the type needed for innovation, firm creation, growth, and employment in dynamic firms, is accumulated only by a privileged few or only in a small part of a country, convergence to the frontier will be the privilege of only a few and certainly not sustainable for the country as a whole. Moreover, as the example of Italy clearly shows, if institutional quality widely differs among regions inside the country, the country as a whole will not be successful. Market forces tend to produce strong agglomeration effects, which are very good for winners, but without uh, counteracting public policies can be devastating for the losers. Uh, this, em this emphasizes the importance of ensuring good quality governance throughout the country and a reform design that pays attention to distributional effects in the broader sense. The right composition of reforms is also necessary to make convergence fast and sustainable. I argue that productivity enhancing innovation inside a firm is a key element. This is part of what I term as a broader institutional design, including private institutions. Having highly educated people with the right skills and relative strength uh, of a country, which is a relative strength in the country, and this is uh, shown in the uh, uh, table, again, always relative to the frontier and rescaled, in this case, the um, uh, human capital indicator index is rescaled to have the same average and the same uh, 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 standard deviation. So the difference between the two columns is meaningful. Uh, this is necessary, but not a sufficient precondition for innovation, as empirical work clearly suggests. It is always the bottleneck in the system that can ultimately cap uh, progress. This emphasizes the importance of comprehensive approach. So looking ahead, why should these countries want reform and what type of reforms should, they, should we hope they want? Global convergence trends stand out to hold major implications for the progress in the region. As the chart shows, the share of world population at the income level where these countries are relative to the worldwide average changed tremendously during the past few decades. The share of world population at the average income level of the countries in the region has increased dramatically. And if you look at the, the last, uh, you know, the lowest part of the panel, the red part is what comes from developing countries. And it's a very steep curve. So if you are just a little bit further to the left, the share of population, world population that is at that level in your niche is actually increasing rapidly. Um, so looking ahead, this means that uh, reforms will have to take into account what happens in the rest of the world. So reforming relative to your past may not be enough if the world moves faster. Similar trends can be seen actually in uh, human capital accumulation, accumulation. For example, as this chart shows, Poland increased significantly the share of people with tertiary education, the share of population, but South Korea increased even faster. Now, if you look into the kind of uh, a, a secondary level of education, this change is even more dramatic to the supply of uh, this kind of knowledge structure in the rest of the world increased dramatically. Uh, so as a consequence, the scarcity value of the other than frontier knowledge, this is the type of knowledge this region has, declined significantly and will decline even faster in the future. So let me come back to reversals in light of these global trends. The reversal of long-standing or significant reforms risks both unraveling hard-won progress, but also uh, stifling future reform momentum, possibly forever. Reform reversals are no doubt hindering convergence, but they will do so significantly more if the rest of the world is moving ahead fast. Let me take the example of educational att uh, attainment. Um, allowing the quality of skills to deteriorate as it seems to be happening in Hungary, and this is what the chart uh, shows using the PISA test results, or leaving some groups 
in society behind, as it is the case with Roma people in many countries in the region, puts these young people in a very disadvantageous situation as the world is moving ahead fast. As a crisis response, the EU put forward major in initiatives to promote the single market for services and the digital single market. Theory predicts that small, very open economies in the region stand to be major beneficiaries of such reforms. But firms must be well prepared. Furthermore, flanking reforms at the national level may be essential to help firms to benefit from the opening of borders and the increase in competition and to maintain public support for reforms designed at the EU level, which is frequently per perceived by people in the region as being far away. National reforms that allow firms to enter the markets, minimize the short-term costs of reforms, reabsorb displaced capital or labor, and adequately support those who lose out are critical in this regard. Exporting firms, new firms, and particularly new innovating firms are best placed to benefit, uh, but are also subject to much higher risk of failure. Hence, reforms to make firm creation and resolution easier and cheaper will be important. Capital Markets Union is another major area of EU-level reforms that can help convergence, particularly in countries closer to the frontier where innovation becomes much more important. For SMEs and new firms, innovation is an especially risky venture and equity is a much more adequate source of finance than loans. As equity finance is underdeveloped in the region, easy access to sources from abroad via the Capital Market Union can be a major help. Many of the most successful startup firms in the region have relied on foreign source of equity and the knowledge, knowledge set that came with this financing. The FSI is also a particularly helpful EU-level reform in this regard, but countries in the region need to do more to better position their firms to benefit from opportunity. Quality of government and distance from the frontier are closely linked with causality, causality running in both directions. The closer the country gets to the frontier, the more essential this factor becomes. Given the key importance of governments in education and providing the legal and institutional framework for innovation and, risk, uh, and risky finance. I'm sorry. As the chart shows, some of the countries are well positioned to move ahead because they have a better fundamentals than their income level would suggest. But some countries have somewhat less. It's important to point out that Romania, which seems to have somewhat less, is very further away from the frontier, so it is not as binding as it is on the left-hand side of the curve. The same applies to, sorry, now I'm, I'm, I made a critical mistake. Someone should start uh, this one. Okay, sorry. Because I went to the last chart. You're reaching the conclusion anyway. Yes, I'm reaching the conclusion so. anyhow. Okay. So let me try to summarize the, um, the, uh, my findings. To sum up, the speed and sustainability of convergence in the region will crucially depend on reform efforts. As these countries get closer to the frontier, reforms that support innovation, selection, and allocative efficiency will become more important. The quality of government, corruption, education, firm creation, and resolution, financing of innovation, and innovative firms will be key areas for reforms. The Commission has recently, recently made policy recommendations very much in line with these uh, considerations. Looking forward, the more focused and adequate to the country's position relative to the frontier, the more useful policy and policy recommendation from the outside will be to promote sustainable convergence. EU and Euro area membership serve as a useful anchor for such reforms, but apparently this was more so before accession. Membership in itself does not guarantee sustainable convergence. Looking forward, Euro adoption could serve as a motivating goal that boosts and focuses reforms efforts in the region, but for this factor to work, people in the countries concerned will have to want Euro adoption. Finally, reform reversals deserve particular attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Isvan. I have to say it was very telling that you spent part of your presentation discussing the uh, uh, pitfalls of convergence or the risk of not converging to the frontier based on a slide which actually shows four Eurozone countries. Yes. 
So uh, that uh, also tells us that a lot of the lessons that we we'll learn from our discussion tonight are also uh, relevant for, for us here in the Eurozone. Uh, so we should, uh, we should take it seriously also for, for ourselves. Um, so we now move to the, um, to the, uh, to the next speakers. Uh, I think we'll do it in alphabetical order as the uh, program suggests. So Kalin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Benoit. Uh, first, I want to thank you for, for the invitation and for the opportunity to, to present my views on, on this is a very broad topic and very philosophical topic. So uh, I would like to narrow down and be a more micro view on the, and country specific view on the, on the convergence and especially on the, uh, on why we see a slower convergence after the, the, the Great Recession and what we might draw as, a, as a factors that affecting this. I already said this point that uh, convergence, what also Dubravko said, convergence is not God-given, so it's not something that uh, divine right and every country have to achieve it. Uh, it's first and second, countries have to, to do a right policy to achieve this. And second, it, convergence comes in the context of the area that you, economic area that you are integrated. So uh, that's why I put this slide just to, it's a derivation basically of the two periods, uh, one period, uh, 2001, 2008, and it's estimate the cumulative convergence for this period of the countries. And then on the vertical assets, you see the cumulative convergence after the global financial crisis, which is 2009, 2016. So basically, three, three uh, conclusions from this uh, side. All Central European and Southeastern countries, they converge in both periods, uh, before the crisis and after the crisis with exception of Slovenia and Croatia. It was mentioned the, uh, this morning that in the, in the, after the crisis, they basically have uh, deviation, backtracking from the convergence. But all of these countries converge in both period. And of course, something that was seen this morning, these countries uh, in the second period were converging for. Uh, then we have the euro area countries, with excluding uh, uh, excluding Luxembourg and Ireland because Luxembourg is uh, out there and Ireland did a very big uh, revision in the GDP, so it's, uh, it's difficult mm -hmm. to explain uh, their, uh, their numbers. Then we see three groups in the euro area. Uh, one of first group that they converge very fast in the boom period, but then in the, after the crisis, they, they show significant divergence, especially uh, Greece, Cyprus, Spain, and Finland. Then we have a second group that, and it's also visible in the in the eastern slide. Uh, second group that's in both periods, in the global boom and in uh, and after the crisis, they were diverging from the EU mean. So, basically, this uh, EU mean, EU 28 per capita on the PPS. So we have these groups that. Uh, the and then with the third group, which is other euro area countries that basically uh, were not converging in the first period, but they're doing better after the crisis. So the point here is uh, on sustainability, basically, Central and Eastern European countries, they show sustainable conversion over both periods before the crisis and after the crisis. And countries that were in euro area have a very mixed, uh, very mixed, uh, 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 very mixed um, performance, some of it driven by excessive, uh, excessive uh, development in the real estate sector, financial sector, or government, uh, uh, government sector. Uh, I mean, inefficiency in the fiscal policy and unsustainable fiscal policy. Uh, this basically affects the, the converging countries in two ways. One is first in, in the first period that they were attacking a lot of FDIs and water inflows. Uh, this slowed down in the second period, so uh, these countries need excess uh, foreign savings in order to, to invest more because they start with low saving rate and low capital accumulation. So this one factor that was affecting convergence post-crisis because they were not getting that much inflow of capital, 
And second, they were not getting that much external demand because some of the countries was adjusting downwards, so there was uh, uh, very weak external demand. And all of these countries are very linked to to, to European Union, to the uh, to the to the trade channels and to the integration if in a value-added chains. Uh, this is basically the 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 big story, which is there are two channels. One is domestic policy and Second channel is external policy. So, what you face outside, which with, within your trading partners and within the uh, relations with the economies that you are importing capital and you are integrated financially and uh, economically. Then, it's already been said that uh, uh, TFP was do going down in all of these countries. Uh, there was not much about investment. I mean, that's why we, it's a working problem, but we did a paper that trying to explain why investment in Bulgaria was so weak after the, uh, the crisis. So, because all of these countries were, ha were having very big, uh, very strong increase in investment before the crisis, and after that, there was a, a downwards adjustment, they remain at the very low level. So it's a standard models that, that structural VAR models that are common in the literature, and ECB has something like this in the, uh, in, uh, published last year. And basically, uh, measuring the factor that affects investment. What's interesting, which confirms the, the, the first point, that uh, when you regress investment uh, conditional on uncertainty, conditional on uh, uh, on external demand, on return on capital, uh, on access to financing, also to European funds' uh, contribution to investment. So the, the most significant factors for the post-crisis uh, period uh, uh, external demand, and then uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty derived by surveys of uh, expectation for companies, expectation, European Commission surveys, and um, and then you have effect on uh, on return on capital, and after that you have other effects like uh, European funds. But so external demand and external uncertainty was playing very significant role in this model. This is one of the points that I wanted to make in this. On the top of this, when you look on the convergence, there another big factor is uh, shrinking labor force. Uh, shrinking labor force due to uh, migration. Uh, there are two channels. One is workers going to work abroad due to the wage differential, and the second channel is young people going to study abroad and they do not uh, return, which is the very strong channel because it's related also with the export of uh, human capital. And this relates with the second. Uh, and then uh, this shrinking population driven by aging and uh, migration. And then on the top of this, the quality of these labor forces also uh, not improving because they are part of the uh, labor force which is uh, which is not going to school basically minorities and uh, Roma minority that they access they have access to school but they have no culture to to go to school and then the institutions do not press that much their families to to attain the school so it's a, it's a strong channel with the shrinking labor force uh, we see uh, that also the quality of this labor force and then finally, uh, and I have some other things, but finally on the euro area, because this one say you need to, to have a willingness to go to the euro, and how, and there is also in the question, and it's related with the investment, how uh, uh, five presidents' reports on reflection, uh, reflection paper uh, affects thinking. There is one thing with tax harmonization that is going to depress the convergence. Because countries that are currently converged, like most of Central European countries, they have very low capital, uh, taxation on capital and taxation on labor, in particular my, my country. Uh, and it's natural because when you have a low capital stock in the economy, you don't tax capital because you want people to accumulate capital. And then you have a shrinking labor force, an outflow of people, you do not tax that much 
labor, but you provide very low taxation on labor and you tax consumption in order for people to save and to provide saving for, for investment in, the, in capital. So tax harmonization is going to play a very negative uh, role uh, if gone in the direction of increase of corporate and income tax level. Uh, in, uh, in Europe if we go to the harmonization of the... I'll stop here, then I will take part in the discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Kalin. I think you're raising an important issue at the end, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I agree with you, by the way, but uh, I think it's important to raise the issue that um, it's not only about the challenges that you're facing as a, as a converging country, it's also that you're converging towards a moving target, which yeah. is the rest of the EU, and in particular the Eurozone, which is itself undertaking a process of uh, rejuvenation if I may say so, or hopefully. Um, and the question, uh, one of the questions will be which kind of externalities does it create for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for the other countries? And certainly that, that should be an important part of the discussion, on, uh, uh, in particular on, uh, on Eurozone reform. Uh, that with, uh, it also, it's also about the other countries, and we're not alone. So I, I agree with that. Uh, Deborah, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I think entering at uh, this... Uh stage of uh, the debate, uh, uh, a large part of uh, my, the, the first part of my presentation is uh, completely redundant. So I just uh, share the view with everybody else that the region has to change the ground model and take more ownership of creating a business environment that, that is much more competitive. And this has to do with institutions, but, uh, but also with investment. And then what I will focus on is mostly on the investment part. And uh, I wanted to show a few, a very few slides that um, come from uh, two recent uh, big studies that we put in place at the European Investment Bank. Uh, one is an investment survey that is looking at uh, 12,500 firms in Europe. It's very complementary to SAFE because we really focus on investment and not only on the financial side. But I think it gives us uh, very much the idea of uh, what are the constraints for firms to invest to investment and what are they looking for, uh, for in terms of uh, um, becoming more competitive and on the other side we did a second survey this year on 600 municipalities in europe and to me that comes out with very interesting messages on uh, the um, i would say if i'm very strong in the, in the message incapacity of planning uh, on the usage of uh, some of the EU funds. Uh, and that is uh, something uh, that, uh, that uh, where, the, where uh, we can have a very strong improvement going forward. I, if I, no, how did you move? Sorry. <laughs> okay, this I can skip. Just, okay. Uh, on this one, only I, I just wanted, uh, it's almost invisible, but I just wanted uh, to focus on the graph uh, on uh, the left. Uh, that is basically showing, uh, for me it's very interesting because I also saw the one of uh, the EU periphery and other countries. Basically we have uh, the blue line is uh, uh, investment, the red line is saving. What I find very interesting is uh, that uh, the current uh, account correction in the region, and these are the EU countries, uh, basically comes uh, from some increase in saving, but from a big drop in the investment side. So this is a kind of a painful correction, because it's not, in the periphery you have a much more uh, stronger increase in saving, and then investment remaining uh, stronger. And I think here for the region is a message that the grow model has to come and to stay a little bit self-sustainable and with more investment support coming from policies. Um, on the investment side, we see the recovery, and we see the recovery. We saw the recovery particularly related uh, before 2016. What I wanted to pass as a message is the incredibly, incredibly strong dependency in the region for the EU-funded public investments. And it, this is very important for tourism. On the one side, because absorption of these funds and proper absorption of these funds is, is very important on the one side. On the other, because the European Union is starting to discuss the new multi-annual financial frameworks, and there are very strong pressures coming from everybody Everybody, particularly following Brexit, on where to cut. So I think that using the resources available in this funding period in the right way is extremely important. 
because it's not so much granted how much new resources uh, will, uh, uh, the entity of the resources in the second, uh, in the next uh, uh, multi-annual financial framework. If uh, we look at uh, the, uh, in this, uh, um, in the first uh, graph, uh, what I wanted uh, to show is uh, coming uh, from uh, this uh, survey on investment and is looking uh, at how much, uh, where do investment, uh, uh, where do firms invest? In the region, the share the, the, devoted to intangible is much lower than in the rest of the EU. And it's interesting because it's not only related to research and development, but for all the different forms of uh, intangibles. And we really think that all different forms of intangible are important, and not only the research and development part. And a large part of the policies implemented at the national, but also at the European level, are only targeting R&D, while there are other areas like skills development, etc., that are particularly important. So one message that I think is very important in terms of policies, target all intangible and really try to do something more in terms of incentivizing intangible investment in the region. Um, the second graph is a little bit more complicated. It's showing the volatility, the dispersion of a marginal prod product of capital and labor, and basically gives you an idea of inefficiency in the allocation of resources. And there you have the cohesion countries, periphery, and other, you can think at core Europe, because there is the UK in, we didn't call it anymore core, <laughs> but it's called other, uh, as you see, the dispersion is increasing all over and also in cohesion. So uh, the misallocation of resources is increasing all over Europe and also in cohesion. So there is a room to do in, to in terms of reallocating resources. It's not only a story for the region, but it's a story for uh, all over uh, Europe. I Sorry, ju just to understand the figure, is it the dispersion across branches? I mean, at which level, mm. at, at which level of granularity is the uh, the dispersion being uh, being observed? Is it is it is it across across branches or across companies within a country, or is it just it's, is it just within uh, between countries? It's uh, it's uh, estimated uh, firm level data with a panel with uh, all the European firms. I can't move anymore. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, the inefficiency related to inefficient uh, uh, allocation of resources. I think uh, this is something very interesting uh, that comes out always uh, from uh, our survey, and this is uh, the different behavior of uh, foreign and domestic owned firms uh, in the region. And uh, this gives you an idea. I, I don't want to say that the foreign firms are necessarily always the best, but uh, what you see is uh, that uh, some of the domestic firms are kind of lagging behind in terms of uh, their innovation capacity. This, I think, is very important, uh, particularly they are uh, much less active uh, in uh, uh, implementing uh, innovation uh, that is uh, new to the world and also have a much higher share of firms uh, that don't innovate at all, so not even adopt innovation. C the domestic firms are investing less, so there is a lower percentage that is investing, and we also ask in the survey to self-assess the quality of the capital stock uh, it's a self-assessment, so it's qualitative, but you see that foreign firms tend to, uh, to state that they have a better quality of the capital stock. So there is a difference in terms of resources, and there are probably policies to look at domestic firms and understand why there is this very strong um, divide between the two and whether you should have some uh, more flexibility in the system uh, that uh, leads also either the domestic to innovate more, to keep the peace, adopt innovation co compared to the others, uh, or some uh, readjustment in the system uh, to take place. I'm looking at here uh, in the first graph, uh, we ask uh, to firms uh, what are the main impediments uh, to investments. And here, the most interesting thing, this is uh, the second year that we do the survey. Last year, the main impediment was uncertainty. This year, the main impediment is availability of uh, people with the right skills. In the region, this is extremely important, and it's related, uh, obviously, we know it, and we also see from the, the other graph from uh, outward migration in the region. 
but the problem is a problem Okay, it's a problem all over Europe. And uh, again, on that point of view, I think uh, policies uh, have really to look uh, at uh, what to do in terms of skills. And skills is not only a matter of the top skills, it's also a matter of a mismatch of skill at the lower level. I have a last slide, and that is coming from what I was mentioning in terms of uh, the study that we are doing on municipalities. And here the message comes out on asking to municipality what are the most important barriers to their own investment. And here there are two interesting elements. The first barrier is a budget constraint, or if you want also it's related to these debt ceilings. That has to do with really the fiscal constraint for the municipality. But the, the, there is a part that is also related to uh, length of procedure, uh, to competences, etc. But uh, the most uh, striking number that comes from uh, this uh, survey, and I'm finishing, uh, is uh, that uh, it's not in the graph, but <laughs> that 40% uh, um, of municipalities actually take uh, an investment decision based on a uh, uh, um, economic rate of return calculation of the project. So there is a lot of investment decisions that are not based on economic rational that happen at the municipal level. And this is something very important. And if I have to sum up whatever I was saying, I think that the main priority for the region is try to have much more prioritization and planning in terms of economic usage of uh, uh, economic means in terms of uh, public policies uh, and also trying uh, to, um, to create uh, the right incentive for the business sector in the right sector, so related to innovation uh, and uh, intangible investment. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. So let, let's move to Ghent, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will try to tackle the specifics, which are uh, mostly with uh, my country and similarities with uh, other countries of the region, because most of the topics and points were already tackled from the distinguished speakers previously. However, uh, each country has uh, its own specifics, and despite of the similarities, we, I will briefly talk about the SSE convergence process and uh, convergence in the region and then in Albania. Basically, uh, the long-term political future and economic prosperity of the SEE region is firmly linked to the EU convergence and integration processes. While individual countries have differences, a common specific they all share is the economic and political benefits from the process. SEE countries benefited from the rapid efficiency gains uh, due to large-scale liberalization reforms during the transition period. Uh, there have been a lot of reforms undertaken in all SE countries. Many were presented even here. However, whatever has happened during the transition period, uh, the economic and financial crisis uh, uh, had a hit on the speed and acceleration of the reforms and also in the convergence of uh, dynamics for the region. Uh, convergence uh, slow down due to the diminishing returns from the capital and labor, as well as uh, from fading efficiency gains. It was already mentioned from the uh, preliminary speakers that there is a risk of falling into middle income trap, that because of the low level of innovation, pure quality of institutions, and unfavorable democratics in the future. We talked a lot for the institutions. Uh, it's very crucial, very important the institutional role in our countries because they are the, the actors who are responsible for undertaking and performing the reforms. In this context, uh, it is uh, very imperative to prepare our economies from a graph for, for a gradual trans <coughs> transition from efficiency-gaze-driven systems into innovation-driven ones. 
this is easily to say. I mean, innovation, as my colleagues spoke uh, previously, is seen mostly in the foreign investors, in the foreign firms and domestic firms. However, efforts should be done, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, tries and uh, thoughts and ideas and uh, initiatives should be undertaken. In, in terms of the innovation for any country in order to increase competitiveness of the country productivity towards the EU member countries. As mentioned, quality of institutions is paramount in the facilitating to, to the move to the next development stage. Uh, quality of institution is, uh, is really critical. I mean, uh, this is really, it's very complex. It's absolutely very complex because it's relating with many elements. First of all, it's uh, related with the quality of the human resources, uh, which is uh, related also with education and with many reforms that should be undertaken. It's been undertaken, but it's also with inherited tradition and many other things. However, this is a process, this is a fight that should never end, and uh, no one should give, should give up, but it should continue to improve the institutions. As mentioned also previously, institutions first of all about people, then anything else. So there is a necessity for intelligent targeting structural reforms. Definitely structural reforms are the ones that will be addressing all the matters that we are talking, and the structural reforms uh, as, a, as, an object, as, a, as major objectives to promote business environment, to implement the rule of law, innovation capacities and competitiveness, and so on. Uh, with regard to Albania, but I mean uh, talking about my country, many other countries in the region, especially neighboring countries, are having almost the same issues. The institutional, institutional setup has been largely contributing <coughs> to the convergence process and macroeconomic policy making, which has been improved considerably during the last times. Talking briefly about the central bank, it's uh, absolutely clear we are all central bankers. We're central bankers here, and uh, mostly we are central bankers here. And uh, the independence of the institution is playing a crucial role. And uh, we are specifically following an inflation inflation targeting regime. By law, actually, we have the price stability. Of course, the financial stability. It's uh, one of our our main objective. But the price stability. It's uh, by law the number one. As a central bank, we are having, we are seeking an inflation targeting regime and, the free f and following a free floating exchange rate. We seek to, to reach the inflation targeting by next year. On the other side, fiscal policy is on a steady consolidation path and debt reducing fiscal rule is adopted. We have approved last year a law in the fiscal rule. Uh, actually, as many other countries, uh, my country as well, is, we're suffering for a very high public debt. It went on the level of 72%. And we have already approved a fiscal law, a new, a new law which obliges us to decrease continuously the, the public debt in the next coming years, and the intention is to go up to the level of 60% in a few years. There is a range of structural policy initiatives to strengthen financial stability as well. In terms of financial stability, luckily, despite of the crisis, despite of whatever has happened during these years, we have had quite a very stable uh, financial stability situation, and this is due to certain elements and certain factors. First of all, uh, uh, the same as many other countries in the region, in Albania as well, there are mostly European member, EU member country banks uh, as a foreign direct investors that are representing most of the financial market in the banking sector. And they brought a lot of know-how and technology in the beginning, and they raised also, in terms of lending as well, they contributed to the growth of economy, but on, uh, at the moment, after the crisis, uh, they became a bit uh, sluggish and a bit not contributing as much as before the crisis due to their own issues, the leveraging process, and so on. So basically, we have been suffering from a high MPL. After the crisis, MPL became an issue, which were, uh, which were really uh, inducing pessimism and not optimism in the decision pro decision taking process in terms of lending in the banking sector and lending is very crucial because we really had a very low lending level after the crisis we came from the very high levels that we don't seek in fact to go still in the same levels because by growing 25 or 
uh, each year in lending, of course, uh, will crash again, and uh, there is a potential a huge risk to produce again MPLs. We as a central bankers are conservative, and we intend to have a prudential lending, but still we need to... Banks are intermediate, financial intermediaries, and they need, to, they need to play their role. And the major role that we need for the growth and acceleration of the convergence is, first of all, before, before innovation is lending. And in this context, we needed to decrease MPL. There was a detailed plan that we followed, and finally it's resulting successfully as we are bringing this down. However, <clears throat> that was one of the major reforms or efforts that uh, we have spent in the terms of the financial sector in the market. There have been a certain laws being approved with regard to financial, uh, financial sector for execution of collateral, still for the effects of the MPL, but as well for the bank resolution. I mean, we did approve the bank resolution law. The Greek crisis, the difficulties that we faced two years ago with the Greek crisis in the financial system put us, uh, put us, made us aware that we might face really serious difficulties in terms of financial system and we needed to, to revise our legal framework very carefully and uh, see ourselves and test ourselves. We did the stress testing and so on. So basically, there have been a certain laws, but the most important one was the approved the bankruptcy law and so on, but the bank resolution law was the one that was the most uh, recently approved. Uh, as well, it's important to mention that the dependence and efficiency of a financial stability <coughs> authority, FSA, in the country and deposit insurance agency has to be strengthened further because with these two authorities which are separated from the central bank, we definitely have to cooperate. Uh, so, basically, uh, in order to to conclude, because many things were, were already mentioned, in Albania, I mean, uh, to accelerate the economic convergence to EU countries, we need to, to engage in continuous structural reforms, aiming to improve institutional development, business sophistication, innovation capacity, techno technological readiness, financial markets development, and rule of law and quality of the ju judiciary. Judiciary reform has been one of the most important reforms taken recently that we faced a lot of political implications. However, from the legal point of view, this is done. Now we have to implement. This is a real another challenge. Many reforms has been undertaken that had a real, imp uh, real positive effect in the growth. We come uh, from 1% to, to 4% growth this year due to undertaking certain reform during last three years. They were also under the IMF program educational reforms, active labor market reform, judicial reform, as I mentioned, energy sector reform, and so on, pension system, and so on. So reforms need to be undertaken, but reforms need to be undertaken based on uh, priorities that each country have. Well, we saw our gaps and our, uh, our uh, difficulties, and uh, uh, reforms were set up based on these priorities. Uh, However, we need to continue. I mean, basically, the reform agenda is ongoing. Uh, the structural reforms, I would say, are very important for, for each of us, not only for the central bank, but all the actors in order to progress. Thank you. I will stop it here. Thank you very much. I I'm pressing all of you a little bit to keep to the timeline, but then we have plenty of time for the discussion, okay. so don't worry if there is anything you forgot or you wanted to to say, uh, you will have an opportunity to come back. So Boris, last but not least, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Benoit, thanks for inviting me again to this event. And as you know, they say that being a 12th person speaking at the day conference uh, on the same topic is a little bit <laughs> feeling like a seventh husband of Elizabeth Taylor poor guy coming back home and wondering what can I do that has not been done here before. So this is pretty much how I feel, but I'll try to at least, you know, uh, uh, put a little bit different light on some of the issues that have already been raised to make the further discussion more interesting. So one thing that has been discussed is the convergence. Uh, this picture you've seen five times at least uh, today, but uh, let, me, let me say that uh, uh, there are three things that I would like only to, to highlight here. First, 
is that as it has been said, convergence is not here uh, to be taken for granted. Uh, we have obviously examples of convergence uh, happening for some time, then being stalled, and we've seen that if you look at the European Union, for example, versus the US, uh, where there has been a convergence, then it stopped, uh, then there has been the convergence of south of Europe towards the north of Europe, and that convergence has also stopped, and then it was followed in the end by the convergence of Central East Europe towards the rest, or the East Europe towards the old Europe. Uh, that convergence has not stopped, but has significantly slowed down, and now we wonder what's gonna happen in the future. Um, one thing that we don't want to, if we, if you look at the speed of convergence, we don't know exactly what the benchmark is, what should be the speed of convergence also. If we look at the period before the crisis, uh, is this exactly where we want to go back to? Probably not, because that has led to some extent to a crisis. That was, the, that was uh, probably in many ways too rapid uh, it was based on a high uh, accumulation of the, not only of FDIs, which is a, which is a good thing, good cholesterol, but also on the on the leverage buildup, which is a bad cholesterol and something that, uh, not only that we don't want to see happening again, but will probably in the medium run not happen again because of uh, the the different structure that we're seeing now of the of the economics and and of the regulation. Um, also, with the, with the inflow of capital to the East Europe, that was the, some call it the low-hanging fruit, being harvested in the beginning, uh, or, or neo schumpeterian view, as Sergei has said, of uh, moving uh, from well inside the production possibilities frontier towards the possibilities uh, frontier uh, in, a, in a very easy way of uh, reallocation of hugely misallocated resources. We've seen inflow of the capital that helped that, but with the inflow of this capital from the old Europe, some of the Malays of the old Europe might have been also imported into the East Europe. And that might be another thing that will make uh, a growth more sclerotic in the future in Central East Europe. TFP, that has been also shown, I know, more than five times today. But what do we really know about the uh, total factor productivity? I'm afraid that uh, total factor productivity might be to some extent more a consequence of our inability to properly measure what we should measure than anything that we should really put on our slides and comment like what's going with it. If you look at here just accumulation of the capital and you look at the Romania, this is the green line at the bottom of the, on the left-hand slide. And then you look at the total factor productivity in Romania. I wonder, does anyone in this room believes this is true? I don't. No? So one has to be very careful talking about what's going on with the total factor productivity. I, I'm afraid that it's mostly the, the, the consequence of our inability to properly measure the accumulation of capital and uh, and the labor. Well, having said that, I would of course agree with everyone who previously said that there are things which are positively correlated with the growth, and that these are the institutional quality and human capital in the first place. But having said that, these are the two things which even if we had no data at all, we would have thought are influencing the growth positively. So here it's only that the data do not basically confront what our prior beliefs about that would be. Uh, <coughs> now, if we move further and then see what has happened really with these two most mentioned uh, factors of probably total factor productivity or something that needs to be influenced unobservables if you want in order to reignite the growth to to have more convergence in the in the future then we can actually see that not much has happened in the past in the first place there has not been really a convergence 
in terms of the quality of institutions, nor in terms of the human capital. Very little. Huh? So we should ask ourselves then how did we converge in the first place up until now, if there was no convergence with these th two things of which we have been talking so much today uh, in the first place. So obviously there has been something else at place, what we mentioned, you know, easy things, reallocation, moving within the frontier, and now we'll have to focus for the first time to really do something serious about the institutions and the human capital in our countries. If we really believe, and I think we do believe, at least when we go public in our countries, we speak that these things are important and how they have to be changed, and these are the things that we call structural reforms. Now, these are the things which also consist of many measurement errors, but we would again agree probably that doing structural reforms of that sort helps uh, increase the potential rate of growth of the GDP. But the question really is how to, how to get these things right. And there are generally, as has been also said already today, two dimensions of structural reforms. One is moving closer to the efficiency frontier, and the other one, potential growth rate, which is basically expanding the efficiency frontier. It has been said that the first one has been happening, but if you compare Europe to other emerging countries, much less of the second one has been happening. And we have to ask why. One thing that has been mentioned in the discussion has been the quality of the human capital. The other one was also the institutions that in a way hinder competition and do not incentivize the innovation R&D investments, etc. The third one that we talked about over the lunch, and I thought that Benoit will mention it, but since he didn't, I will, is the structure of the financial markets. I was about to, but uh, okay. Is <laughs> 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 the structure of the financial markets, which does not incentivize really uh, uh, those type of the capital investments which turn out to be most productive in terms of the innovation, and this is a obviously European problem, but not only the Central East European problem, uh, of too little capital markets, too much reliance on the banks. No? So this is something that will have to change. And this has been, this is one of these things that have been important to Central East Europe from the West Europe. But we'll have to also change the structure of the, of the uh, financial markets. Some things are already changing, but are changing more, I would say, because the technology change in the finance, like the fintech, where you see small companies now raising capital through crowdfunding, rather than being really a, a consequence of the, of the changes in the capital market structure in our countries, which were incentivized by the, by the government. They're actually independent of anything that the government does. Actually, the government is looking at it. It doesn't know what to do with it. We don't know actually how we're going to regulate all these things further down the road. Another question is how much do we really know when it comes to all these reforms, what are their synergies, at which pace and uh, in which order they should be implemented? Should we try to implement them all? which are more important than the other ones? What are the diminishing marginal effects of these reforms? These are all very difficult questions. And I don't, I'm not aware that we really understand a lot about that. So in a way, the safe bet is just to go out and say, these are all things that need to be done. And then politicians should choose what they want to do and in which order they want to do it and they should be the ones that will calculate the you know, diminishing marginal returns or the political costs of doing these reforms. Without much help from the economists so far, as far as I can see it. So maybe we can help them a little bit more on that and in that sense you know, be more uh, constructive in pushing the, the reforms that are needed to increase the potential rate of growth in the future. 
One thing which might be a real obstacle to doing reforms in the future, and this is taken from uh, EBRD, Sergei Stings, you talked about that in Dubrovnik, less here. But this is striking, I must say, when I was uh, looking at your presentation in Dubrovnik, and if you take Germany as a benchmark, and you look at these answers in all Central East European countries, and you see what the attitude is of the voters towards some common values which are needed for the reforms, like the market economy, or democracy versus autocracy, or their faith in the institutions like a fair justice system or law and order, then one would assume that in order to do the things that we were talking about today, one would first have to change this. Otherwise, it's going to be extremely difficult to, as economists, to preach to the politicians, you have to do this and that, but look who is voting look at the value system of the voters. If that is not changed, and this is not something that we economists deal with typically in what we do, then it's very difficult to expect that there will be a possibility, a real possibility, to do the reforms that we were talking about today here. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, to all speakers.